I'm from the uh, Cloy group in the University of Mainz in Germany, so not, far, not, uh, not very far from here. So uh, today I will be talking about the work that I carried out during my PhD. So I've, I will be talking about uh, the strong interfacial exchange coupling that uh, we find in the uh, manganese to gold permalloy bilayer system and why it is uh, important. So first of all, I would like to give you a brief introduction uh, about the antiferromagnetic material that we work on. This is uh, manganese to gold. So it is, an, uh, it is an antiferromagnet with a very special crystallographic symmetry. So for example, if you take a look, it is uh, a centrosymmetric compound and every gold atom can be considered to be the global inversion center for this compound, yeah? So in this one unit cell, you can consider this central gold atom to be the uh, inversion center. And next, it, uh, next, the magnetic sublattices form inversion partners. So if you look at this compound, it has two sublattices, manganese A and manganese B. So the two sublattices form inversion partners with respect to the central, uh, central global inversion, uh, this inversion center. So for example, if you have uh, an atom, uh, belong, uh, a manganese atom belonging to the sublattice A at a certain distance above it, at the same distance below it, you would have a manganese atom from the sublattice B. So that's what you mean when you say the two sublattices form inversion partners. And the third and final condition is that there should be locally broken structure inversion symmetry on the individual magnetic sublattices. So for example, if you're sitting on this particular manganese uh, atom, you at a certain distance above it, you have gold, and at the same distance below it, you have manganese. So the inversion symmetry is broken locally on the uh, sublattices. So when you have all of these three uh, symmetry conditions satisfy simultaneously in a compound, it becomes a candidate for something known as a Neal spin orbit torque. So what does this Neal spin orbit torque do? So say if, for example, yeah, when the compound looks like this and you drive a uh, current along uh, its easy axis, say along the 110 direction, then the current exerts staggered spin orbit fields on the two magnetic sublattices, which causes a rotation of the magnetic moments and yeah, an effective uh, reorientation of the, uh, the nail order or the spin axis. And but now by passing another current pulse along the new spin axis, you can rotate it back to the original configuration. So that's what you can, uh, you can find this effect only in two compounds. One of them is of course manganese to gold, the other one is uh, copper manganese arsenide. And uh, yeah, so this is a very nice uh, analogy. Uh, so a current which is passed through the structure, it uh, exerts opposite uh, fields on the opposite sublattices. So here it is kind of illustrated using uh, oppositely, uh, the opposite windings of these uh, oasted fields, oasted coils, yeah. So that's what the current of, uh, that's what the action of the current looks like. So yes, so uh, the prediction was uh, followed by experimental reports. Uh, the first one was in copper manganese arsenide from the group in uh, Nottingham University, and which was also then uh, subsequently followed by, uh, by the report on, uh, in manganese to gold in uh, Mainz University. So this was the work that was done by the time I joined the group. And uh, what I focus on is not switching. Like, I mean, here what they do is apply electrical pulses and then they measure uh, the magneto resistance uh, the anisotropic, magne anisotropic magneto resistance of the structure, and based, of the, and based on this, they try to understand if they have switched the uh, magnetic order or not. But the, uh, yeah, so this is, these are the switching experiments, but this is not what I do. I mainly study interfacial effects uh, involving manganese to gold, so I will tell you what that is. So first of all, I would like to uh, briefly talk about how we grow this material. So we start with a sapphire substrate, so this is uh, aluminum crystalline aluminum oxide, and we use the R plane of sapphire, one minus one zero two. Over this, we put a seed layer or a buffer layer of tantalum, which is about 13 nanometers, and it's epitaxial, so it is tantalum zero zero one. On top of this, we put an anti uh, we grow the antiferromagnetic layer of manganese to gold in the zero zero one orientation. So the tantalum buffer layer uh, is used because uh, there's a very, very good lattice match between the two uh, materials. And I think it's about, the lattice mismatch is about 0.6%, so it serves as a really good buffer layer. And uh, yes, so we grow this uh, using two techniques, both MBE and sputtering. And uh, interestingly, uh, both of them give the same kind of crystalline quality. So both of these are done in our lab in Mainz. 
Uh, and uh, yeah, this is uh, an in-plane X-ray diffraction scan showing you the epitaxial relationship between the, uh, the seed layer and the uh, manganese to gold layer. So as expected, the, the, the tantalum 100 is parallel to the manganese to gold 100 as expected from the lattice match. So that's, that is the growth that we do in mines. And uh, yeah, so basically what we understood is that uh, MBE gives slightly better quality with respect to uh, sputtering in terms of the thin film uh, morphology, but in terms of the thin film crystallinity, both of uh, the techniques give rise to the same uh, level of uh, crystalline uh, uh, quality. Yeah. So, so uh, due to the high throughput of uh, the sputtering procedure, we mainly use uh, sputtered films for all our experiments. So everything that I show on subsequent slides uh, were, was done using sputtered films. So this is, uh, yeah. So this is a scanning tunneling microscopy image of one such sputtered manganese to gold film. So this is about 40, uh, uh, 40 nanometer thick film. And what you see here are terraces. So very, very smooth, atomically flat terraces. And you observe that these terraces are separated by steps, which always have a, uh, a step height, which is uh, an integral multiple of half a unit cell. And this is going to be very important, uh, so please keep this in mind. So the step, uh, so the basically the step heights are always an integral multiple of half the unit cell length. And then we also carried out some uh, high resolution transmission electron microscopy. And uh, yeah, so manganese to gold basically has this tetragonal structure and the film looks like this. So this is the cross section of the film. And uh, you see this is, the, uh, this is the termination of the manganese to gold. And what we observe, uh, these, uh, I mean, you observe these bright dots. So they are the gold atoms. So this means that the film terminates in a gold layer. So as I showed you, manganese to gold is a layered antiferromagnet. So there's a layer of gold, then there's a layer of manganese B sublattice, then a layer of manganese A sublattice, and then another layer of gold. So this uh, film that we grow, it terminates in a gold layer. And next, uh, yeah. So what I do now after growing my manganese to gold, so basically the way manganese to gold grows is that the unit cell of this tetragonal uh, structure uh, the, the unit cell is ro uh, rotated such that the basal plane makes, uh, I mean, a 45 degree uh, angle with respect to the edge of the substrate. So uh, it is rotated, it, it grows in this particular way. And over this, we deposit a, a, a thin layer of iron or permalloy directly on top of the manganese to gold at room temperature. So it is sputtered in the same chamber, uh, uh, yeah, after, right after manganese to gold is made. So yes, and now we try to see what happens when you have this kind of uh, anti-ferromagnet, ferromagnet uh, interface. So for the, yeah, and then this is another transmission electron microscopy image of the cross section of the stack. So you have uh, basically, yes, this is the tantalum buffer layer, there's a manganese to gold anti-ferromagnet on top of which we put permalloy ferromagnet. So you see it's a very nice and sharp uh, interface. There's no intermixing at all, no interdiffusion. And all of this is protected by a silicon nitride cap. So yes, and now what I do is basically uh, I try to image the domains, the ferromagnetic domains of this permalloy overlayer, which is expected to be exchange coupled to this manganese to gold antiferromagnet at the interface. So for this, what we use is a technique called SEMPA. So this is an in-house technique. It's a, it basically is a scanning electron microscope with an additional detector. So it works just like a scanning electron microscope. You have this perm, uh, you have a primary beam of electrons is coming uh, from the uh, SEM column and then it interacts with your sample. And then you have the secondary electrons which are ejected. These secondary electrons, they undergo a spin dependent scattering at this tungsten 100 crystal. So the tungsten has a large spin orbit coupling and uh, it causes an asymmetric scattering of uh, the up and down spin electrons. So, so the, all, the up, all the up spin electrons are uh, deflected towards one of the electron multipliers and the other down spin uh, electron channel is deflected to an other electron multiplier. Now, uh, now, if you count the number of up spins and the down spins which are being received by the two channel trons or the electron multipliers, uh, you can basically calculate spin polarization. And if you know the spin polarization, I mean, when you sc scan across the sample, you can build a map of spin polarization all across the sample. 
And this helps you to resolve the magnetic structure of your sample. So you can look at your magnetic domains. And every in-plane uh, magnetization can be resolved into horizontal and vertical components. So in this image, I show you a set of two opposite channel trons. Uh, which measure, which basically count up and down spin electrons. You will also have another orthogonal set of ele uh, electron multipliers which are not shown uh, in the out of plane uh, uh, alignment. So they will count the left and right spins. So in that way, you will have both uh, uh, horizontal and vertical components of magnetization. And of course, if you add up the total number of electrons which are re being received by all four channeltrons together, then what you get is basically the morphological information like a regular scanning electron microscope. So yeah, so simultaneously you collect both morphological and magnetic information using this technique. And the best thing about it is that it is an in-house technique and it's relatively fast. Uh, so yeah, so I took my manganese to gold and iron bilayer and I carried out uh, this kind of imaging of the uh, ferromagnetic layer on top. So as I already explained that you measure spin polarization here in this technique and as an antiferromagnet does not have a net spin polarization, it cannot really be visualized using this technique. But since the ferromagnet is sitting on top, uh, you can take a look at the ferromagnet because of its net spin polarization. So yes, so this is what the morphological image looks like and then you get the, uh, you get the two components of uh, the magnetic domains. So this is the magnetic information, these are the raw images produced by the uh, SEMPA. And uh, when you put them together as a vector sum, what you, uh, what you obtain is uh, this image. So this is the vector sum of these two components. Yeah, just generated using a simple MATLAB code. And uh, uh, you can see four different colors inside. And basically the image is color coded with this uh, color wheel. And uh, yeah, what you observe is four different colors inside. And these four colors uh, correspond to these four magnetization directions. So basically, uh, yeah, so you, you find four different kinds of domain orientations in the sample. And if you compare this to the manganese, to, uh, sorry, if you compare this to the underlying manganese to gold moments. So this is how the antiferromagnetic moments of manganese to gold are oriented. They are along the 110 and 1 minus 10 directions of the unit cell. And now if you compare the two, you observe that uh, there is a 45 degree angle uh, between the ferromagnetic moments and the antiferromagnetic moments. So we, co uh, we call this as a biquadratic exchange coupling. And why does this happen? Uh, this is most likely because of the epitaxial growth of iron on top of uh, manganese to go gold. So it turns out that uh, what happens is when you deposit iron even at room temperature on top of manganese to gold, it grows epitaxially in the 001 orientation. This is something we did not expect in the beginning. Uh, but yeah, it happens. And of course, iron is known for its large magnetocrystalline uh, anisotropy. So this 45 degree orientation that you observe is sort of a compromise between, uh, between the exchange coupling to the uh, manganese to gold and its own magnetocrystalline anisotropy. So there's a compromise and uh, uh, in the end you get a 45 degree uh, uh, relative orientation. So of course, uh, one way to test this theory, uh, I mean, one way to get rid of this 45 degree angle is uh, by trying something which is very soft, a ferromagnet which is uh, much softer than iron and which does not have its own magnetocrystalline anisotropy. And uh, the most famous uh, soft ferromagnet is of course permaloy. Uh, so the next sample that I tried was uh, permaloy deposited on manganese to gold instead of iron. So yeah, four nanometers of permaloy on 40 nanometers of iron. Yeah, we start with the morphological image and then what you observe is uh, the horizontal and vertical components of magnetization. And uh, yeah, of course, once again, you see the same type of uh, domains. It's the same shape and size of the domains, about one micrometer on an average. And uh, when you put them together again as a vector sum, this time you observe completely different colors and uh, these correspond to completely different directions, basically. So now if you compare the magnetic mo uh, moments of the uh, permaloy overlayer and compare them to the manganese to gold underlayer, you see that now the magnetic moments are collinear. So I think in this way, the, the suspicion that it was indeed the magnetocrystalline anisotropy which was leading rise to this, uh, which was giving rise to this uh, 45 degree biquadratic coupling that is solved. So yes, yeah, so now you have a collinear coupling uh, uh, with permaloy. And then, uh, yeah. 
Yeah, so this is a collinear interfacial exchange coupling at antiferromagnetic manganese to gold and uh, ferromagnetic permalloy. So then what we tried to do is uh, we went to a synchrotron and we carried out XMLD peen to first image the domains of manganese to gold at a certain spot. So this is an antiferromagnet and the only way to image this is, is using XMLD peen, so which relies upon the difference in the absorption of uh, uh, linearly polarized X-rays along X and Y directions. So yeah, so this is the domain image that we ob observed in case of manganese to gold. And then on the same spot, we also uh, imaged the ferromagnetic overlayer and we get this sort of domain pattern. So interestingly, you see there's a perfect one-to-one -one correspondence between the domains of the ferromagnet and the domains of the antiferromagnet. So, which is very interesting because now the antiferromagnetic domain pattern is completely copied into the domain pattern of the ferromagnet. We can actually look at antiferromagnets in-house with our scanning electron microscope with polarization analysis. So this is a huge advantage for us and we don't really have to uh, wait for uh, beam time uh, uh, proposals being accepted and uh, yeah. So, so that is what we observed. And, uh, but why does this happen? Yeah, I mean, uh, first of all, we also observed that the average domain size is much larger than the average terrace size of the manganese to gold, which I showed previously. So what exactly is going on there? So this, uh, I try to explain that using this cartoon. So if you look at uh, manganese to gold, as I, I explained earlier, it always terminates in a gold uh, layer. And this is also evident from the scanning tunneling microscopy image because like I said, the step heights were always an integral multiple of half a unit cell. And whenever you have such kind of half a unit cell or some integral multiple of half a unit cell uh, as a step, then you always terminate at a gold at a gold plane. And this was already confirmed by the TEM image. So when you have such kind of a termination, you also observe that owing to the uh, crystal structure of manganese to gold, what you observe is that below the gold, you always have the same kind of sublattice. So for example, within one antiferromagnetic domain, if you consider this antiferromagnetic domain A, you see that below the gold, you always have sublattice A. So basically when you put permalloy on top, this structure is neatly copied into the permalloy, I mean, without any trouble, even at, because even though you have a step here, it doesn't really matter because the domain does not terminate at a step, but rather it is able to expand over this step because of this uh, fixed atomic gold, I mean, fixed uh, termination that we have. So yes, that is the main reason. The domains can form randomly. They do not, they do not actually form at um, steps. Uh, they can form anywhere. So that is also the reason why the domains can, uh, stra uh, the domains can be larger than the uh, terraces that I've previously shown using scanning uh, tunneling microscopy. So, yeah, so this is the reason why you have this 100% uh, correspondence between the ferromagnetic and antiferromagnetic layers. So, yes, and then I also try to do some uh, uh, additional characterization of this uh, bilayer stack. So the idea was to put this inside a squid magnetometer and run some ferromagnetic hysteresis loops and try to observe the coercivity to quantify the strength of this exchange coupling. So when you uh, take this, yeah, the standard sample, 40 nanometers of antiferromagnetic manganese to gold and four nanometers of ferromagnetic permalloy, and you run a ferromagnetic hysteresis loop, you observe this nice uh, square-shaped switching. And then what you see is that the coercive field is about 1400 Tesla, which is extremely huge because permalloy, it's such a soft ferromagnet, its coercivity is about zero. Yeah, so its coercive field is about zero, uh, zero oosted. But what you observe here is 1400 oosted. So where does this super large coercive field come from? So that, is, that was the next question. So what we did is we also kept the... Uh, the thickness of the manganese to gold constant and we just varied the thickness of the permalloy and we observe this nice uh, linear trend when we plot coercive field versus the inverse of uh, saturation magnetic uh, magnetization or saturation magnetic moment in this case. Yeah, and yeah, so I will explain briefly what this linear relationship also means. So yeah, so another thing that I observe is that even when you increase the thickness of the permalloy to 10 nanometers, you still observe this really nice exchange coupling. So this is, this is already evidence for a very strong exchange coupling because this can even survive at very high thicknesses of the ferromagnet. So 
what is the origin of this large coercive field in permalloy? So to understand this, what we did is once again went back to uh, the synchrotron in, uh, in the UK, Diamond, and what we did here was uh, spectroscopic XMCD and XMLD measurements. So we took, first of all, an as-grown sample, which was not subjected to any magnetic fields, and we tried to do XMCD of the permalloy, and we observed zero XMCD, uh, which, uh, which can be understood easily because you have all four types of domains, and uh, it averages over the, uh, en uh, the entire illuminated area, which means the net, uh, the net XMCD, the net uh, extramagnetic circular dichroism would be zero. And then when you apply a magnetic field of about one Tesla along uh, the y-axis, you see that a strong XMCD uh, signal appears at the, at the L2 and L3 edges of, uh, uh, of uh, nickel. So yeah, so we, this now the strong XMCD signal is definitely evidence that you've made it into a monodomain. And then what, what happens to the manganese to gold simultaneously? So you observe that simultaneously you also get an XMLD signal in the manganese to gold. So this is evidence that the manganese to gold has also become a monodomain. So in the as grown state, it would have had like two possible uh, types of domains because it has two easy axes, one, one, zero and one minus one, zero. So in the as grown state, it would have shown a zero net XMLD but now it shows a strong uh, XMLD signal because it has also converted into a monodomain. Basically, it means when you switch your ferromagnet, you drag your antiferromagnet with it. The, ex the mutual exchange coupling is so strong that you can never switch one independently of the other. They both switch together simultaneously. And then we try to apply a field along another orthogonal axis and you observe a reversal in the in the sign of the XMLD, which means, yeah, you can do this back and forth, basically. So now what this means is that, yeah, first of all, yes, the AFM and antiferromagnet always, uh, antiferromagnet and ferromagnet always switch together, but also what this means is that the large coercivity, which I showed you before, it is not just the strength of the exchange coupling, but it actually represents the magnetocrystalline anisotropy of manganese to gold itself. So this, this, coercive field is the field that you, I mean, basically, if you multiply this field with the magnetization, or the magnetic moment of the permalloy, that is nothing but the energy that you need or the, the work that you need to do to switch the uh, manganese to gold moments against its own magnetocrystalline anisotropy. So that is the reason why the product of M, the product of M and HC is always a constant, and that is why this is a straight line. So. So basically what we now have concluded from this is that you have a super strong exchange coupling at the manganese to gold and permalloy interface and the coercive field that we measure is an indication of the, uh, is basically a quanti quantification of the magnetocrystalline anisotropy of the antiferromagnet itself. And we see a perfect imprinting of the uh, antiferromagnetic domain pattern on the ferromagnetic overlayer. And that means that now we can do in-house imaging of the antiferromagnet, and this is very useful for us because if we want to further study uh, Neil's orbitalk based switching of the antiferromagnet, we can do this in-house. So yeah, that's, that's the importance. And of course, if you have uh, an, a ferromagnet which is strongly coupled to the antiferromagnet and which switches simultaneously together with the antiferromagnet, you can also think of devices where you can enable a readout of the uh, antiferromagnet using uh, very high magnetoresistance techniques like TMR, for example. So this is one of the major challenges in antiferromagnetic spintronics that you don't have uh, effective means to read out antiferromagnetic spintronics devices, but by incorporating a ferromagnet, you could rely on uh, some large effects like TMR. So that's also one of the ideas. And uh, so I would, uh, like to thank the Deutsche Forschungsgemeinschaft and the Spin Plus X projects which fund this research. And uh, yeah, I also acknowledge the funding given to me by the Max Planck Graduate Center in Mainz. And yeah, that's the Chloe group. That is a special uh, uh, group meeting session during COVID times. And uh, yeah, and uh, these are our collaborators from the various beam lines. And thank you all for your attention. And